Okay, uh, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last co course of the quarter. Um, I uh, really wanted to say a few words at the beginning, and then uh, what I want to finish my, my part as quickly as possible, and then the teaching team, nicely sitting on the, there on the right of the, of the class, uh, is going to give an overview of the topics we covered uh, in this uh, course this quarter, and give, a, um, give kind of an overview of the important concepts, and the hope is that this will help you study with the final exam. Uh, and then uh, we should all know what to do for the final exam, the times, uh, the, the early version on Monday, the, the real thing I think on Tuesday. Uh, SCPD students should know how things are going and so on. So if you have any doubts, uh, reach out to us because we want to make sure that the final exam process goes smoothly. Um, and then all I wanted to say is uh, I wanted to thank you for the very good quarter, all the excellent questions and discussions we had. Thank you for the hard work uh, on the homeworks and on the gradients and, uh, um, and, and, and also for, uh, to the people who are actually uh, coming in class and asking me questions and making uh, my experience in this class to be fun. Um, and then, of course, what I wanted to say is I think you should be proud of yourself because you, you learned a lot in this course. We went through many different methods that uh, all are very practical. And uh, as you continue either be doing research, being PhD students, going in, going in industry, um, uh, working at, as a research scientist, the toolbox uh, you learned uh, in this class will be uh, amazingly useful whenever you deal uh, with data and with uh, practical problems. Um, so with that, I'd really like to thank you all. You, you achieved a lot. You did great. Don't worry too much about the final. It will be awesome. Um, and you know, the spring break is coming. The sun is out. It's actually a good time. Uh, so thank you so much. And now um, Young is going to take over and talk about MapReduce and frequent item set mining. Go ahead. You can. Thank you, Uri. Hello. Okay. Good. Yeah, All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Let's get started. Um, so first, uh, we're going to review about uh, MapReduce and the frequent item sets mining. Um, MapReduce is a uh, programming model designed for light data sets with easy parallelization and fault tolerance. Um, there are three steps of MapReduce. So the, uh, we can see these three steps uh, from this diagram. Uh, it's easier to see here. So first, um, the map function, uh, the map will take uh, each input and it will give us a uh, assigned value for each key. And um, for the group by key phase, um, the MapReduce will actually collect the pairs and then uh, do sort and shuffle and assign each um, data in to different reducers. And in the final phase, we have reduced. Reduced phase will actually just take all of the um, data and deal with the, um, deal with the values with the same keys. And then we give output and concat them together. Um, so one thing to know for MapReduce is how it deal with uh, failures. Um, MapReduce is to uh, design for like computing nodes with failures. The output for, from previous phase will actually be stored so you can restart the task without like starting the whole jobs, which will be time consuming. And to uh, assure uh, the reduced task actually produce the right results, we have this blocking property. Uh, property. So no output from, um, the, uh, map, from the map task will be used for a reduced task if it's filled. So we we'll actually we'll just restart the um, map task, and then we use, only use the right outputs from map task. And then we also learned about data flow systems. So MapReduce is pretty strict. Um, so it only has two ranks of tasks. So you need to do map and reduce, map and reduce. So, um, and the data flow system generalizes this. So instead of just having the map and reduce, we can have any number of tasks. And with um, like other functions, such as join, subtract, things like that. And so Spark is like the most popular data flow system right now. Um, okay, so we'll talk about frequent item sets. It's pretty useful because um, for uh, it's market uh, it's market basket model, and the main application for this is 
we can, uh, after we compute all the frequent itemses, we can use it to compute the confidence, the interests, and to get the association rules. Um, those are the three, uh, th those are two algorithms to compute frequent itemses in memory. So we'll talk about how do you deal with, um, with large data sets that cannot fit into memory. But those, are, th those two, a priori and PC-wise, is to compute frequent itemses in memory. And first, for, uh, for a priori, um, it's pretty straightforward. For the first, uh, it has two passes. For the first pass, we, uh, we uh, keep a count of um, the items only. Because um, the bottleneck for this um, frequent item says counting is uh, mostly is just the uh, frequent pairs. Um, because you consider like uh, you need to combine any two items to see whether they're frequent. So uh, the a priori first counts the uh, items, and in the second pass, it will shrink the item counts to only the frequent items because by um, monotonicity, we only need to count the candidate pairs that both are from uh, frequent items. And so this could save us, um, so, so we can use the, um, it could save us some memory to compute the candidate pairs. And there's an um, uh, improved, improved algorithm called PCY. PCY also have two passes. Uh, for pass one, we will keep account for the items and use the same uh, amount of memory as a priori. But unlike PCY, we will also use the rest of memory for the first pass. So the idea is we will keep a hash table for pairs, and you count like um, the counts for like different pairs for the uh, first pass, and you keep the buckets of this hash table uh, as many as possible. Uh, during the second pass, we we'll shrink the item counts to frequent items, and for the hash tables, we just need to um, uh, convert it to a bitmap to see whether uh, each bucket is uh, above a threshold S that we said before. Um, so if it's uh, above threshold, we said to be one, otherwise zero. So when we count the candidate pairs, we just need to uh, go through the hash function and to see whether it's hashed to the bucket uh, with one. And if it's hashed to one, then we keep, uh, we keep the counts of this pair. Um, and then uh, the, the previous two algorithms are just for um, the data we can fit into memory. And we can use, utilize those two algorithms to deal with, um, uh, to, as a, uh, uh, as, um, as a building block to build this uh, more complicated algorithm we can count, uh, we can do item counts for data we cannot fit in memory. So uh, the first one is just simple random sample. And the second is SON. For SON, we will um, go through the data with small chunks. We, we still go through all of the data, but we just deal with it uh, one at a time. And the random sample cannot guarantee that we have all of the frequent items, but SON can. And there's an improved version of uh, uh, Tovenus algorithm. We can uh, improve from the random samples where we keep not only the frequent items, but also its uh, negative borders. And during the lecture, we proved that for this, uh, we start from random sample, and we count the frequent items, frequent pairs, and, all, and its uh, negative borders, and during this uh, second pass, we count the frequent item sets and their negative borders. If um, no uh, item sets in the no uh, negative border uh, is frequent, then we can guarantee um, we've had all of the frequent item sets. So that, that's a pretty good guarantee. But if we failed, so if the negative border is penetrated, we need to start again from another sample. OK, um, that's it for uh, uh, room item sets. Um, we'll give it to the next person. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about LSH and clustering. 
Um, so we discuss a very important algorithm for finding similar items um, or similar documents called locality sensitive hashing. Um, this algorithm so require only uh, order of n runtime instead of order of n squared. Uh, you don't need to compare every pair. So it's an uh, order of n um, algorithm and uh, it gives pretty good uh, result in terms of uh, getting similar uh, items. So LSH, you need to do uh, three steps. So first you need to uh, get the shingling of the documents and then you need to find the mean hashing and then the LSH step. So, so shingling is to convert documents into a set representation of its uh, uh, K uh, tokens, uh, K, K grams basically. And uh, um, so you want to get a K as large as possible uh, so that you don't have a too low probability of, uh, uh, of, uh, of for, for a shingle happening, uh, happening in all the documents. Um, so, um, so we use uh, Jacquard similarity to measure the similarity of documents where uh, the similarity is defined as the, the size of the intersection of two documents over of its singles over its unions. Um, then we need to get a, we want to hash the documents into the same bucket with higher probability if they are similar and with lower probability if they are dissimilar. And uh, for Jacquard similarity, mean hashing is a desired uh, hashing function where the probability of hashing two documents in the same bucket is the same as their similarity. Um, so, so in the cl in class, we discuss how to perform mean hashing. So basically, you get a, a permutation of its shingles and you find and you hash it into the first bucket where there's a one. So the general, the general theory of locality sensitive hashing, um, suppose, so, so, so we defined the, uh, um, yeah, so, so basically uh, the, the LSH family you choose is based on the distance measure you choose. And so for documents, we chose uh, Jacquard similarity and we have mean hashing. Um, but for different, uh, for different measures of uh, distance, you can have different hash functions that you want to use. And uh, we also define the D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive hashing, where uh, uh, that means that if the document is at least D1, uh, is within D1 um, similar, then there's a probability of higher than P1 to, to hash them into the same bucket. And if it's uh, further than D2 away, then the probability of hashing it into the same bucket is less than P2. And uh, uh, we discussed how we can use and and or composition to basically magnify um, the, 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 um, the probability of uh, getting it into the same bucket. And so without and and or, we have this, the straight line uh, where the hashing the same, the, we're hashing two documents in the same bucket is the same as its similarity. So there's a straight line. And using N and OR composition, we can basically bend the straight line into this uh, red curve. And to be more specific, um, yeah. So suppose we, we have, um, we use the, the B bands and R rows technique that we introduced in the class. So the probability, so let's go over the probability of uh, uh, hashing uh, the two documents into the same bucket. So, so for the B and R uh, configuration, you have R rows of, uh, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the signatures and uh, you have B bands of those R rows. So basically you hash the two documents in the same, it's a candidate pair when there is at least one band you hash all of them into the same bucket. <clears throat> so the probability of that happening is uh, because we have, the, because we have uh, the similarity is S, then the probability of hashing one document into the same bucket is, is S. And uh, 
and in, in, the, in the same band, there are different rows. So probably of hashing all of them in the same bucket is S to the R. And uh, at, least, uh, at least one of them, uh, <coughs> so, so for them to do disagree in at least one of the band is one minus, what, what, for them to, uh, to be disagreed for at least one of the rows is one minus S to the R. And uh, because we have K bands, uh, we have B bands, we have uh, one minus S to the R to the B. So that is uh, uh, the probability of signatures disagree at, in at least one row of all of the bands. And one minus that is the probability of, uh, of the signature agree in all, row, uh, in all rows for one particular band, at least. So then that's the probability of, of uh, two documents become a candidate pair. It's one minus, one minus S to the R to the B. Yeah. But, but in, in general, uh, you can have uh, more different uh, configuration of, uh, configurations of how you use and and or composition. Uh, for a D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive family, if you use uh, end construction using R rows, then you convert it into a D1, D2, P1 to the R, P2 to the R sensitive family. And similarly, if you use a or construction with B bands, you convert it into a D1, D2, 1 minus P minus one minus p one to the b and one minus one minus p two to the b sensitive family. So using r using uh, or composition, you make all the probabilities higher, and using n composition, uh, you lower the probabilities. Okay, so clustering. Um, so clustering is a um, unsupervised learning. Um, Algorithm where you a method where you want to where you're given a set of points and a measure of distance and you want to uh, assign the points that are close close to each other into the same uh, clusters. Um, there are two general types of approaches for this uh, for this task. The first is the uh, the point assignments where you assign where you initialize centroids and you assign points based on the distance to the centroids, and then you iterate over and uh, refine the assignment. The second one is a hierarchical clustering, where each point starts with, uh, with the cluster as its own, and you combine uh, clusters based on the distance. Yeah, so for, um, for point assignment, we discuss k-means. Uh, it's basically, yeah, we just k-means and, uh, and a uh, modification of k-means called BFR algorithm, where it allows you to run k-means uh, on a very large data set. <coughs> and for hierarchical clustering, um, so as we discussed, is um, you basically merge clusters based on a measure of distance. And uh, you can use max distance or mean distance or the average distance to merge clusters. And this will give you, so, so in some sense, this is, in, in some cases it might be better because they will give you uh, uh, some clusters that, are, that you won't have in k-means, like the ring-shaped clusters. You, you will get this from, from hierarchical clustering, but you won't get this from k-means sometimes. Okay, so um, I will be talking about uh, dimensionality reduction and recommender systems today. Um, so first, let's uh, look at uh, some uh, motivation for why we need to do dimensionality reduction. Um, so in some cases, we might need to save some storage, do some faster processing, uh, maybe discover some hidden structure. And uh, there are a couple of methods that we discussed in the class. Specifically, we'll be looking at SVD and CUR. Um, they are both different kinds of decompositions. Um, SVD, you try to express your matrix M as the product of three matrices, uh, U sigma V transpose. Um, U and V are orthogonal matrices, which means that U transpose U is equal to the identity matrix. 
Um, sigma is a diagonal matrix with uh, non-negative entries on the diagonals. The entries along the diagonal are called the singular values of your matrix M. Um, so uh, what we use SVD for practically while doing dimensionality reduction is to uh, do singular value thresholding, which means that you typically keep the top uh, X uh, singular values that you want to hold that you think have enough information uh, to describe your matrix M, set the others to zero and therefore reduce the dimensionality. Um, the SVD always exists for any real matrix M and is unique up to a permutation of the sign of your uh, singular vectors. Um, so how would one actually go about finding uh, the SVD? Um, so we need to find, to find sigma and V, let's say for instance. Um, you first look at uh, the eigen decomposition of M transpose M, where M transpose M is a real symmetric matrix. Um, using this, you can come up with uh, uh, the, sing uh, the eigenvalues D of M transpose M, as well as the singular vector, uh, uh, the eigenvectors V. Uh, v would be the right singular vectors of M, while uh, sigma would be the uh, square root of the eigenvalues of uh, the, the matrix D. Um, so similarly, if you start from M, M transpose instead of M transpose M, you can uh, compute uh, U as well as sigma. So that gives us a method to co uh, compute U, sigma, and V. Um, so how we actually calculate eigenvalues is by doing power iteration, where you start with a random initialization and then keep multiplying with the same matrix over and over again to get the principal eigenvector. Um, so a small note is um, M transpose M and M, M transpose are both real symmetric matrices if uh, M is real. Um, and if you have a real, a real symmetric matrix, your eigen decomposition is off the form Q lambda Q transpose, where Q is your eigenvector basis and lambda is your diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. Okay, um, so now we look at CUR, which is another method to do uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, so you do non-uniform sampling from the rows of A itself, where the uh, row column importance, uh, which is basically the uh, probability fraction by which you sample them, uh, is proportional to the norm of these columns. Um, you combine uh, R and C, you, you make the intersection and take the pseudo inverse of that submatrix, and that becomes your U in your CUR decomposition. Um, so in terms of why CU, uh, the trade-offs between SVD and CUR, um, CUR could be more interpretable because you actually use rows and columns from the matrix M itself rather than this abstract concept of singular vectors. Um, sparsity is preserved, um, U and V are dense matrices, whereas C and R are sparse since you expect your rows and columns and your recommendation matrix to be uh, sparse. Uh, however, CUR might also output redundant features. You might have like multiple of these uh, vectors in uh, C or R that happen to be pretty much the same thing or very similar. Um, so that's basically uh, between uh, SVD and CUR. So where you have A, which is typically a huge and sparse matrix. Uh, in SVD, uh, your U and sig uh, V are both dense matrices, whereas sigma is uh, sparse. In CUR, it's the opposite. Um, C and R are sparse matrices, whereas U is dense. Okay, so now we'll go over a quick overview of uh, recommender systems. So um, the first uh, kind of recommender system that we saw in this class was about content-based recommender systems. So the general premise is that you are given a, a matrix of users and items and their ratings, and you want to predict missing ratings that you don't know from this matrix. Um, so what you do in content-based uh, Recommender systems is you recommend items uh, to a given customer similar to the previous items that they rated highly. So you do some sort of feature engineering, come up with uh, a user profile, and you estimate uh, similarity typically using cosine. Uh, the next thing we looked at was collaborative filtering. Typically, this is of two types, user, user, and item, item collaborative filtering. User, um, user collaborative filtering gives uh, the rating that a user might give based on similar users who have rated the same item and conversely for item items uh, collaborative filtering. Um, you could use a number of uh, similarity metrics such as Jacquard distance, cosine similarity, and Pearson correlation. Um, and this is basically how you use some sort of uh, normalized similarity with ratings product to predict the rating of uh, item I for user, uh, predict the rating, uh, rating of user X for item I. Um, you could also remove the baseline estimates and. Uh, only model the deviations from the baseline estimate so that we are not affected by user or item bias. There might be some users who tend to rate certain items always highly, so we don't want to be affected by that. So the uh, last thing that we saw in terms of recommender systems was latent factor models, which again boils down to some sort of matrix factorization approach. Uh, 
you try to take your rec uh, rating matrix R and uh, express it as a product of two thinnish matrices. Um, one of these could be expressed as like the product of your singular uh, value matrix sigma along with the right singular vector matrix. Um, so these uh, um, latent factors represent sort of uh, abstract concepts in the uh, user item space and we use those to come up with recommendations. Um, so how you could do this was uh, would be to uh, use some sort of stochastic gradient descent to minimize your loss function. You typically include regularization terms so that you can prevent overfitting. Uh, you solve this by SGD as you guys all saw in your problem set. Um, you can also extend this to in include biases just like what we did for collaborative filtering uh, as well as temporal biases that can occur over time. Uh, hi everyone, I'm going to talk about uh, PageRank. Uh, so uh, PageRank is a method for determining the importance of uh, web pages. And uh, the rank of a page depends on how many pages link to it. Uh, pages with higher rank get more uh, of a vote. And uh, if, a uh, if a page of higher rank link to the other page, then that page also have higher rank. So that's like the general idea of uh, PageRank. Uh, a quick example is like uh, we have uh, three nodes, uh, Y, A, and M. Uh, so we can write down the equations to compute the rank of uh, those three nodes. So uh, for example, uh, for, uh, for node Y, uh, so uh, node A, uh, oh, let, let, let's look at uh, the node A first. So uh, there are uh, two nodes that link to A, uh, it's, which are Y and M. Uh, but for Y, it has two uh, outlinks. So uh, in the equation, the rank of A is equal to, uh, is equal to uh, Ry over two because there are two outlinks and we assume like uh, the rank uh, distribute uh, uh, evenly. Uh, so and uh, uh, in terms of the node M, so there, it only have uh, one outlink, so we plus Rm. Uh, so for node, uh, in order to compute the rank of Y, uh, it, uh, it has a link that uh, link to itself, so we have like Ry over two, and uh, uh, node A also linked to Y, but node A has two links, so we, do, uh, we plus Ra over two. And uh, for the uh, last node M, so the, the uh, A links to it, but A has uh, two outlinks, so Rm is equal to Ra over two. So that's how we formulate the uh, equations to compute the page rank. Uh, if we if we have like if we add a te teleportation uh, into our equation, then we will introduce another parameter called uh, like uh, a teleportation parameter is beta. So with uh, that amount of uh, probability, we follow the random uh, walk, and uh, with one minus that, we do the teleportation. So uh, if we want to write down the same uh, equation uh, for to compute the, uh, the the page rank of those three nodes, then we will have like uh, 0 0.8, we assume the, in this case the teleportation parameter beta is equal to 0 0.8, then it's equal to 0 0.8 times the previous part we computed and plus uh, in the end one minus beta, so it's like one minus uh, 0 0.8, that is e equal to 0 0.2 and uh, over three because we teleported to all the nodes and, and we have three nodes uh, in this structure. So uh, we do the same thing for node Y and node M, so we have the equation as shown in the slides. Uh, so he, uh, this this uh, this page like just uh, gives uh, uh, some general formula instead of just a specific example. Uh, so if we want to write down the iterative method to compute the uh, page rank, then we can do, for example, we want to compute the uh, page rank of node j, then it's equal to beta. Uh, it's like the teleportation parameter times uh, all the nodes that's linked to it. So uh, as you can see, the summation of uh, all the node i uh, points to j, and uh, so beta times ri over di, and di is the outlink of node i, uh, and the plus the uh, teleportation uh, uh, term, so it's like one minus beta uh, divided by n, because we assume like teleport to all the nodes and evenly. Uh, we can also uh, write down 
because the first equation is like we compute iteratively, we can also formulate all the nodes in a matrix and uh, using power iteration to uh, to compute the page rank. So uh, the matrix we can do is like uh, using like beta times m and plus uh, one minus beta one over n, uh, which is like uh, n times n matrix. Uh, the, the this this uh, this matrix is like uh, just be careful if uh, as I wrote down in the uh, in here like. Uh, uh, if uh, node i uh, points to node j, then we said uh, mji equal to 1 over di. It's not mij equal to 1 over di. Just be careful with that. If there's no uh, node connect to each other, then the mij, uh, ji just equal to 0. Uh, so next, uh, we uh, talk about the topic-specific uh, page rank. The difference uh, between this and uh, the previous slide is that uh, instead of teleporting to all the nodes in the structure, we just uh, teleport to some specific, specific uh, nodes. So uh, uh, in this case, we, we, don't, we don't add the uh, 1 minus beta over n. Instead, we add uh, like 1 minus beta over s, and s is all the specific set we want to teleport, and the rest is the same, and we can use the power iteration to uh, compute all the page rank. So uh, that's all for, the, for this part of the review. So yeah, let's welcome Ansh. Cool. So um, in, in this topic of graph algorithms, our general problem is finding uh, communities in large graphs, where community can be basically any structure we're interested in within the graph. So for example, we might care about um, triangles, so nodes that have three nodes that have edges between each other, or uh, high density neighborhoods of the graph. Uh, an important tool is uh, the personalized page rank with sweep method. So the intuition is we use a version of page rank with teleport to give a score to all the nodes. We're going to rank the nodes by the score and then have some way of partitioning this um, ordered ranking into the clusters or groups we care about. Um, so an important uh, uh, type or definition to be aware of when we're executing personalized page rank with sweep is this notion of a cut edge, which is an edge. So if we have a cluster, it has one node in the cluster and one node outside. And then another definition is conductance, which gives you a sense of the um, connectivity within a cluster versus uh, relative density outside the graph. And the general strategy when we're sweeping uh, is we're gonna calculate these uh, uh, personalized page rank scores and then order by score and then uh, kind of build a, a set one at a time and calculate a conductance score for it. Uh, and then when we have a local minima of conductance score, that's a good candidate uh, for defining a cluster. Uh, using this general strategy, we can also do motif-based spectral clustering. So um, we're gonna basically do the same thing as before but change our definition of densely linked. Uh, and we're gonna take our original graph and um, have edge weights such that um, it corresponds to our new notion of density and then come up with a new conductance criteria for it. Um, so, if, so we have some, some motif uh, and uh, we, so we turn it into a weighted graph where edges represent the motif 
And then uh, our new conductance score is basically uh, the number of motifs cut. And then finally, uh, another thing we can do, or uh, something we might be interested in, is looking for complete bipartite subgraphs uh, in the original graph. And actually here there's a nice trick, which is we reframe the problem to one of finding frequent item sets, uh, where every vertex is uh, a basket that's defined by its neighbors, and then run the a priori algorithm. Now, uh, graph embeddings. Uh, so here the problem is we wanna do some machine learning on a graph, and so as part of that, we wanna figure out a way to represent nodes in a graph in some continuous vector space while capturing properties around the node that we think are important. So the general intuition is we're gonna come up uh, with a mapping from nodes to embeddings, and then define a node similarity function in both these spaces we care about. So one space is in this continuous embedding space, and one is in, in the graph itself. Uh, in the continuous space, we're, we'll use dot product, uh, and then we'll talk about in a couple slides what the notion of similarity is in the, in the graph space. And then once we have that, uh, we can optimize the, parameter of the parameters of the encoder such that similarities in one representation map to similarities in another. Uh, so actually for uh, the embedding, we're gonna use, um, we're just, we're gonna do the usual embedding, which is just one, every column is, it's, it's the shallow embedding, so every column corresponds to a node. And now we have this problem of how do we define or come up with a way of calling two nodes similar in the original graph structure. So here we propose this notion of a random walk. So uh, we're gonna take two different nodes and start a random walk at those nodes. And then the random walk of particular length will give us a set of neighbors of the nodes. And then if two nodes have similar neighbor sets, we're gonna consider them similar in the graph. Now there's a few ways we can do the random walk. So in lecture we talk about the BFS versus DFS inspired random walk. And it's important to be aware of the biased random walk we use for uh, the node to vec algorithm. So in the, in the biased random walk, we're trying to trade off between the DFS random walk, which uh, goes further from the original node and gives us a global structure of the graph, versus the BFS random walk, which tells us what the, a neighborhood close around the original node looks like. Uh, and so we have these two uh, parameters. So we, we notice that every time we take a step in the random walk, so here we're going from, uh, say, S1 to W, there, then all the neighbors of W can be of three types. One is they're closer to S1, so they're S1, uh, or they're equidistant from S1. The distance between that node and S1 is the same as the distance between S1 and W, or the node is farther from S1 than W. Um, and so in this biased random walk, we're gonna have this parameter P, which tells us a probability of going back towards S1, um, and Q, which is the parameter which tells us the probability of going further than S1, and then uh, we can always stay within the same distance. Uh, so this is uh, the random walk, uh, biased random walk we use for NoteVec. Um, and then finally, uh, now that we have a representation, or we have a definition of similarity in the graph space and an embedding, uh, we want to optimize our embeddings. So similarity in the embedding space corresponds to similarity in the um, graph space. And uh, to do that, uh, we, we define this loss function. So we go over all the, the nodes in the graph and all its neighbors, and then uh, do the minus roughly what ends up being the negative log probability of um, seeing uh, one of the neighbors in a random, uh, you have this, seeing one of the neighbors in a random walk starting at U. Uh, and uh, another thing we covered in the class is how to efficiently calculate this loss function uh, because an observation is that the, we have a double sum happening in this loss function, so we're summing over uh, all the nodes in the graph, and then to calculate that denominator, we have to do um, 
some arithmetic for every single node in the graph. Uh, and it, it'll be useful to be able to look at a loss function and try to come up with a, a runtime approximation or a complexity approximation of what, what it would take to calculate that loss function. I need my yes, you do. All right, uh, it's machine learning time. So um, in this class, we mainly, uh, during lectures, we mainly talk about supervised learning, um, which means uh, you're given a set of data with um, features, x, and a label y uh, for each of the data point. And you try to learn a function that, um, given, uh, given a feature, you try to predict the label, the corresponding label. Um, it's hard because the training set you're given is limited, but you want to generate your model to deal with unseen data uh, in, uh, when you're doing tests or uh, when you're serving, serving the actual model. Um, we've actually also talked about, uh, we've also touched a little bit of uh, large scale unsupervised learning during uh, in your homework four uh, in question three, uh, the k-means clustering uh, thing you, you worked on. Uh, but here we mainly talk about the, uh, the thing we, uh, we covered in the lecture. So we have two types of, types of task, class, classification versus regression. Um, in classification, your label belongs to a discrete set. Um, for example, yes or no, or they might, there might be like more categories. Um, for regression, your label Y is continuous, uh, usually numerical. Um, in lecture, we covered uh, two different methods, decision tree and uh, support vector machine, SVM. So let's first look at the decision tree. Um, given the input, uh, which is D-dimensional attributes, um, it could be numerical or categorical, and uh, we're trying to predict some output label Y, uh, which can also be either numerical or categorical. So given a data point, oops, uh, yeah, the pointer doesn't work. So um, given, a, given a data point, um, we start from the root, and then at, um, at each node, we try to, um, we try to tell um, between a, some kind of splitting criteria and go to the left or right subtree. Um, and then we keep dropping it down until it reaches some leaf node. And at the leaf node, uh, we have some rules that does the prediction um, of the y value accordingly. So now we have three problems. First, how do we split at some node? Um, also, when do we stop splitting, splitting instead, of, uh, instead of keep going? Um, also, once you reach a leaf node, how do you make a prediction? So to split, um, you wanna measure the quality of different candidate um, features and you're gonna choose one of them and also the corresponding value to make a split that helps you make a better distinction uh, among your data. For regression, um, the metric being used is purity value. Um, which is basically um, the weighted average of your left tree and right, uh, left subtree and right subtree variance. And uh, you see that how much um, of the weighted variance you reduce by splitting your tree into a left and right subtree based on some feature and some value. Uh, for classification, it's also kind of similar, but uh, it's, it's um, formalized as information gain uh, using the entropy function, um, which we cover in the lecture in detail. Um, and you're also taking the difference between the entropy before you make the split versus um, the, ent uh, the, the entropy after you make the split on some, uh, some feature value uh, x and its corresponding value. So um, question two, when do we stop? Uh, there are two different criteria. One, uh, one, uh, one heuristic is when your leaf is pure enough, um, which means your data, your data in that leaf, uh, in, that, in that node is not very, uh, it's not very different from each other, so you have a lower variance. Then you say, okay, I can make a pretty good guess about the label. Um, the other criteria would be the number of, number of example in the leaf node. Um, when you have, a, when you have a too small of, uh, of a set of samples in your training data that goes to that leaf node, you probably don't want to split uh, further because you might be overfitting the data. Question three, how do we make a prediction? So for regression, when you reach a leaf node, um, you would want to predict, um, yeah, um, you can either do an average uh, of the samples, samples in the leaf, or you can just build another linear regression model inside of that leaf node, uh, using the data inside that leaf node, uh, and then make a corresponding prediction. Um, in the classification problems, you would just take the, uh, the mode, or uh, the, most, the popular vote, or the most common, uh, the most common value of uh, the label in the leaf node. So in lecture, we also talk about using MapReduce to build large-scale uh, large decision trees. 
um, in the case that the, the tree is pretty small, but the data set you have might be too large to fit in like memory of one computer, or you want to parallelize uh, the training process. Um, so it supports, uh, in general, like hundreds of numerical uh, features. And um, they don't, uh, so Planet works with, um, works with cases where your target variable, uh, your, your target label is numerical. And in Planet, you build your decision tree one layer at a time, starting from root node, be the first layer, second layer, all the way. There are three different tasks being, um, being done using MapReduce. Um, at the beginning, you want to do the initialization where you select a bunch of um, candidate points, which are the features and their corresponding potential splitting values. And then um, you iteratively do the find best split um, function, which evaluates how good a split is, and you select the best split to build a tree. And, th and then uh, at the end, when you, um, when, you, when you run to a tree node that's small enough so that you can do the entire tree building process inside of uh, one machine, you just call it in memory build, which helps uh, either splitting out the tree further a little bit or just directly making it a leaf node. And then um, after this, we talked about tree bagging, which is basically the idea of training multiple different decision trees using um, different random subsets of your data. Um, this helps, like, this helps you, you can think of, you can think of it kind of like an expert system where you have like different, um, different, um, different models uh, that are trained on different subsets of data, and it gives you a slightly different result. And then you try to aggregate them, either taking an average or take the most popular vote, for example, uh, if you're using classification, and then um, you get one final answer according to different output from all these different trees. Also, based on bagging, we have an improvement um, known as random forest, where at each candidate split, you choose a random subset of the features instead of like, considering all uh, candidate features and then you make a split only choosing one of the uh, feature and values in that selected subset. The, the idea of this is you might have some very, very strong features where, uh, and like every single one of your trees will choose that feature because it's so like, powerful. Then it's kind of losing the purpose of training multiple different trees. So you want to put some randomness in. Um, sometimes you want to get rid of some very strong features so that you get um, different ideas uh, on the data set. And uh, using random forest uh, achieves state-of-the-art result in many of the classification problems. Now we look at SVM, support vector machines. So um, given a d-dimensional uh, dimension, d data uh, input feature x, you're trying to make a prediction. Uh, the vanilla SVM works on uh, label, positive or negative labels, so basically a two-class classification problem, um, where point, so, um, in the 2D situation, you need three points, D plus one, three points, um, as your support vectors, and that, they uniquely define a, uh, a decision boundary um, shown as lined over there. And uh, your task would, uh, at, this, at this stage will be maximize your margin, which is defined as the distance from the closest data point, for example, A or uh, B or C uh, on that side, um, to your splitting decision line in the middle. So um, seems like um, seems like some students are having uh, some confusions about like how are we getting from maximized margin to minimizing the uh, the, the weight uh, over there. So um, the intuition is that um, what you want to maximize is the distance from your closest data point to the middle uh, to the middle line over there. And then um, if you do the math, you can actually uh, if you go through the math, you can actually see that um, it's proportional to um, to the to the, margin, uh, to, to the margin value gamma that we defined over, like scaled by uh, your weight. Which means that if you, if you increase your weight by a lot, you can get like very high margin value, which uh, sounds like we get a very good uh, prediction, but um, it apparently doesn't work that way. So um, the way to handle this either we restrict, uh, we fix the scale of our weights at one, and then we want to maximize the, the gamma, uh, or we fix our margin gamma at one, and we try to minimize uh, the weights. Which is why uh, we will be seeing, uh, which is why we'll be seeing, uh, we'll be converting this question into minimizing the weights. Um, however, in the real world, we don't, we rarely see situations where, um, where the dataset is completely, perfectly separable. So some some data might envelop, uh, inevitably fall into the wrong side of the of the line, uh, which is why we need to introduce the penalty. So here. 
Um, we're minimizing this cost function where um, we have the margin, or like uh, this is essentially minimizing the weight uh, from the mm, from the conclusion we had before. Plus, um, this is a this is basically a uh, hyperparameter for regularization um, on the loss that we have over here. And here's uh, here's our hinge loss, which is basically um, if your if your point if your data point falls on the wrong side of the line, or if it falls between the your one and minus one line, you want to introduce a loss, uh, which is basically distance uh, of it going far away uh, from your uh, from the line on your side. Um, notice that um, we're calculating the distance from the data point to um, to the decision boundary of to the, to the one decision boundary on the side of the, that data, um, which means it also penalizes uh, some of the points that falls in the middle of the two lines. And then uh, hence we have our cost function, and uh, we want to get we want to calculate the best uh, W and B uh, our parameters um, to minimize this cost value. Um, there's a closed form solution to that, but uh, given uh, usually our data set is pretty large. Um, we will instead use gradient descent, um, which you guys have done in homework four, question one, um, to calculate the gradients of the cost res res uh, with respect to your parameters and try to minimize. Um, as a summary, decision tree works on classification and uh, regression problems, and uh, you, can you can use numerical and categorical features and labels. And uh, it can build very complicated decision boundaries because you can keep splitting on uh, different parameters and values. On the other hand, support, uh, support vector machines uh, only works for classification problems. And uh, in, vanilla, in a vanilla case, uh, it only works for uh, binary classification. Um, it, it, work, it tends to work well in high dimensional space where uh, the features are sparse. And uh, it, gives a very, uh, it gives a simple linear decision boundary to us. Um, so for this part, we will cover streaming algorithm we have seen in the lecture. Um, consider the case when uh, we are like we our data is coming as a string rather than we have the entire data set, but we still want to measure some important properties of the string, like like some uh, property like we want to know the distinct element in the stream or we want to know the second moment of the stream. So we're gonna have these streaming algorithms to help us give an estimate on this um, properties. So first, uh, wait, wait. Let, uh, first, let's look at uh, the Bloom filter data structure. So the Bloom filter uh, is used in the case when we have a set of interested item, and when a new um, stream item coming in, we want to know if this item is already in our data set or not. So basically, uh, c just consider this example. You have a stream of ads, and um, you want to show it to your customer, but you don't want to uh, show the same ads multiple times. So basically, when a new ad coming, you want to figure out whether it's already in the display history or not. So the naive approach is basically to um, set up a hash table and do a lookup every time a new ad coming in. But that is very memory cost, so it's gonna cost um a number of ad space. So Basically, we want to use smaller amount of memory, uh, say 100 bits, to do this. So this is definitely plausible, but it's just we can then, in this case, we can give a deterministic answer. We can only give an answer um, with high probability. And um, Bloom Filter will help us do this. So the construction of Bloom Filter is really simple. Basically, we just create a bit array of, say, size 100, and we initialize all the bits inside it to be zero. Then we also create a hash function that on uniform hash or has or, or ads to 100 different buckets. And whenever a um, new ad is coming in, we hash this ad to a bucket, for example, say 79, and then we will basically set uh, the bu corresponding bucket to one. Now, how do we test the existence? So remember, our goal is to, it's like when a new ad is coming in, we want to know if, it, if we already said. So basically, uh, 
we, when you add coming in, before we actually add it to the Bloom filter, we will first obtain its hash value, say it's maybe it's 89. Then we will uh, go to bucket 89 and look, well, if it's zero, then we know for sure that the ads um, has never been seen because um, cause no, no um, ad, not nothing is hashed to that bucket. But if uh, that bucket is one, then we can say that with high probability, we have seen this ad before. But we don't know this for sure because this might be, there might be other ads that have uh, hashed to the same bucket. This is caused by hash collision. So the first positive probability of our Bloom filter structure gonna be like this. Note that um, the larger the number of distinct number of ads you have seen so far, the higher the, pro uh, the false positive probability gonna be. So um, there are also like many ways to reduce this uh, false positive probability rate. For example, you can basically increase your memory uh, for the Bloom filter. Uh, here we use 100 bits, but you can use 200 bits. This is gonna be a trade-off between the memory usage and the false positive probability. Um, also, you can use multiple number of hash functions and you check uh, whether all bits corresponding to the hash function is gonna be one. Um, you should, uh, for this, a solution you should use reasonable amount of hash functions because if you use a really large number then it's also going to be a uh, many uh, hash collision uh, remember the curve in the lecture which gives you uh, first the decreasing false positive probability and then uh, increase so you need to use a reasonable number and now let's look at the uh, flagellate martin algorithm and this, prob uh, this algorithm is designed for the case when you want to have a measure of count of um, the distinct, distinct element in your stream seen so far. So the way we do this is basically pick a hash function, hash, that will um, hash your uh, each of element in your stream to log two to the n bits. Then for um, each new element, we basically um, obtain its hash value and then see how many chaining zero does this hash value have and we keep track of a running maximum of chaining zeros. So basically our final estimate of distinct elements is going to be two to the um, maximum of chaining zeros we have ever seen. So the intuition of this algorithm is going to be um, seeing like our trailing zeros going to be unusual because say you have three trailing zeros, then um, uh, it means every eight number will um, will have we, we will be possible to hash to um, this eight uh, three trailing zeros number. So the probability going to be one over eight. So um, if we see more trailing zeros, it means um, highly likely we have more distinct elements because they hash to a, a wider spread of values. And um, so our estimate is going to be higher. Um, now let's look at the AMS method. This method is used to um, estimate the case moment of a stream of uh, a stream of number. So basically, uh, the f we, we have the definition of zeros moment, first moment, second moment here. Zeros moment, uh, we can already use flagellate Martin algorithm to measure. And the first moment is kind of trivial, it's just the length of the stream. The second moment, we can use AM's method to um, estimate. Uh, so what we do is basically to, you have a long stream and you pick a random starting point T. At time T, you have, uh, you have a element of value A coming in. Now you pick this A, and from that time on, you count how many times your A appears. Then you give your final estimate as um, M multiplied by two X minus one. This is kind of like a like random projection of higher moment to like, um, and, and you use this um, uh, sum over this projection to um, basically uh, is basically uh, reconstruct the higher moments. So the application of the second moment could be like estimate the self join size in database. And um, yeah, so I will give this to Stephanie. Hi, I am going to review the topic of web advertising. Um, so first, let's start with the basic problem of matching in a bipartite graph. 
So this problem is, is to find the maximum possible matching for a given bipartite graph. So a bipartite graph is just a graph that has two sets of nodes where there are only edges between the nodes, between, between the nodes of the two sets and there are no edges within the nodes, uh, between, there are no ed uh, edges within the nodes of a given set. Uh, so just given a bipartite graph, our aim is to find the maximum possible matching in the graph. Now this question by itself can be solved in its, uh, I mean we can solve the optimal, we can get the optimal solution for this problem in an offline setting if we are given the graph up front. But what we are interested in here is trying to find a solution when we're working on the online version. So in the online version, we're only given one, set at, at one element at a time from set two and we're given the preferences of, of this element, and we either have to match it to one of the elements in the set one, or just move on to the next, next element. So in this online version, uh, well, one way of doing it is just by matching every, every element greedily. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at the performance of this greedy algorithm, we, we can see that it, the, the greedy achieves a competitive ratio of one half. So competitive ratio here is defined as the worst possible um, ratio of the matching solution that our uh, online algorithm returns when compared to the optimal matching over all possible graph inputs. So greedy algorithm can be shown to have a competitive ratio of one half, while in general, th just from this definition, we can see that this ratio is going to be less than or equal to one for a maximization problem like the matching one. But on the other hand, if you're having a minimization problem like bin packing, where we're trying to minimize the total number of bins that's, that's, that needs to be used to say, uh, pack different items of different volumes, then this ratio is going to be more than or equal to one. So how is matching related to advertising? Advertising can be thought of as an online matching problem. So the web engine, the search engine, it's trying to find the best possible matching by assigning each ad to different bidders. And what is optimal to do in order to maximize its revenue is to rank the bidders in decreasing order of their expected revenue. Here, expected revenue is defined as the product of bid and click-through rate. But this by itself is quite um, tricky to evaluate oftentimes because click-through rates of a lot of bidders are not known to the search engine. And then there's also this fact that uh, we don't want to exhaust any of the bidders' budget too quickly and everybody has a finite budget. Um, now let's consider a very simple setting where we have these four assumptions that all the advertisers have the same budget B, all ads are equally likely to be clicked and they all have the same value, and we only show one ad per query. Uh, in this setting, if we use the greedy algorithm, we get a competitive ratio of one half. But if we instead use the balance algorithm where we pick the advertiser that has the largest unspent budget, then we can show that the competitive ratio here is one minus one by E. And it's interesting to note that this is the highest possible ratio that's, that, that we currently have using any of the known algorithms for this online matching. Um, this is uh, just another case analysis for balance when we just have two bidders and they both have the same budget B. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go over the details of this analysis, but what can be shown is that the competitive ratio in, sorry, um, in this case is going to be three fourths. Um, yeah, well, but the very first point to note here is that when balance stops allocating the ads, at that point, one of the two bidders must have exhausted its budget. And also, all the remaining queries 
should be such that they could have only been assigned to this bidder who had exhausted its budget. So that's the case when uh, balance can no longer assign more, more queries to the bidders. And then we just have two cases to consider when, when uh, based on the amount of the blue queries that we assign to the two bidders. And in each case, we show that the competitive ratio is going to be three-fourth, which just exhaustively proves that that's the competitive ratio. So that was just the general balance scenario using um, this, this assumption, sorry. Uh, yeah, these four assumptions. But if we do not make these four assumptions, then we have the general setting where, where bids, can, bids can be of different values and the bid, bidders can have different budgets. And in this general setting, the competitive ratio of the simple al balance algorithm is very poor. It's, it's going to be zero. And we need to use the generalized balance method where instead of just simply looking at the absolute value of the unspent budget for each bidder, we use this new function psi, which depends on both the bid value as well as the fraction of the budget that's left for each bidder. And now if we use this, what can be shown is that we get back the old competitive ratio. Um, if we go back to the original setting, we, we can actually note that the simple balance case is a, is like a simple uh, specific scenario of the general algorithm when once we make these assumptions. Yeah. Um, uh, next, <clears throat> I'm going to review learning through experimentation. How to start? Bottom. Uh, take action, get reward, and learn from that reward. That process is called learning from experimentation. Uh, usually, we take the approach of formalizing it as a multi-armed bandit problem. So in this problem, we have K-armed bandit, and taking actions is e equivalent to pulling arms. Each arm A wins with fixed probability mu A, and loses uh, with probability one minus mu a. Uh, we want to maximize the total reward in finite steps, but since we have no information about mu a, we have to estimate the payoff mu a. So every time we pull a, we learn a bit about a so we can estimate it. Um, but how to select the arms to pull? Uh, we need some strategy. Uh, therefore, we have several algorithms that, guide, uh, that can guide us about which arms to pull. Uh, all the strategies have different trade-offs between exploration and exploitation. Uh, let's review the definition of exploration, exploration and exploitation. Exploration is that we pull arms uh, that, haven't been, haven't, that we haven't tried before. Exploitation is we pull arm with current highest estimated payoff. So greedy algorithm takes action with highest average re reward on samples have seen so far, but it doesn't explore sufficiently. Uh, epsilon greedy takes a random A with a decaying probability epsilon T, and it takes the same action that greedy would take w uh, with probability one minus epsilon T. During exploration time, uh, it just uh, selects random, uh, randomly select an arm with equal probability. Uh, next, we will review a very important algorithm called UCB. It stands for Upper Confidence Bound. 
uh, it balance it balances exploration and exploitation by taking confidence into consideration. Uh, a confidence interval is a range of values within which we are sure the mean lies with a certain probability. Uh, so let ma equals the number of times a is pulled. Delta is given uh, the given confidence level, like 99%. Then the com with some calculation, uh, the confidence interval is two times a square root of two times ln t over ma. Uh, and our UCB is of this arm a is the estimated payoff plus half of the confidence interval. Then our strategy becomes choosing arm A with the highest upper bound on its confidence interval. Note that the accuracy of uh, asset mu A is dependent on how many times we have tried A. Try uh, too few times means uh, our estimate of mu A could be very off from the true value, which means it has a large confidence interval. This interval shrinks as we try uh, more often. Uh, that's it for this topic, and good luck on your final exams. Hi, in case you guys have questions, we can stay around for a while longer and we pass the mic to the different theories. Otherwise, we see the other